Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, praise the Lord, hallelujah. As everyone is well aware, this day was long awaited and we are joyful to greet our chief guest, His Excellency, Bishop George Palliparambu, SDB, Salatians of St. John Bosco. The Spiritual Revival Ministry extend our warmest welcome to Bishop George for the 16th Ironville Fire Conference 2020. Born in the southern Indian state of Kerala, Bishop George is serving in the corner of the remote northeast Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh for over 40 years. He is the first bishop of my our diocese created in December 2005, which is located in Arunachal Pradesh. His Excellency has been honored with the Bharat Gaurav Lifetime Achievement Award in the House of Commons at the British Parliament in London on April 13, 2018 by Sanskriti Yuva Sanstha, an NGO that promotes Indian culture. He is the first Catholic Bishop to receive this award. His Excellency is relentless when proclaiming the Gospel of Christ in his state. His diocese actively promotes the preservation and protection of nature and focuses on the all-round development of the community. Bishop George firmly believes that a multi-pronged approach is needed to preach the gospel and promote development along with keeping in mind the social teachings of the church. As 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13 says, My brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Likewise, by the grace of God, the diocese of my owl shows no signs of slowing down in the good that it does. They provide education to 20,000 children along with having its own college and hospital and they plan to start a Christian university along with another college in the upcoming years. We are truly blessed to have him in our midst today. All of us are eagerly waiting to hear his word of God and now I invite Bishop George to share the word of God on today's theme. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My dear friends, I want to share with you some of my experiences and the experiences of people in the missions. And I would speak, like to speak especially about the missions in Arunachal Pradesh uh, during of my experience in the last 40 years here. But before I begin, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Brother Xavier and the whole Spiritual Revival Ministry, SRM, for their share and their contribution to the mission in Arunachal Pradesh. I do not remember which year I met uh, Brother Xavier and we met together in Bangalore during a program, after which he showed a lot of interest in the missions here and we entered into a relationship that still goes on. And the SRM has been helping us by coming and staying in the villages and conducting programs for the people and by taking down our young people to Bangalore, teaching them the ways of the gospel, how to preach the gospel, how to be missionaries, how to be uh, conducting prayer services and all these. And at any given time, there are a number of young men and women in Bangalore in the SRM headquarters. And very often there are also SRM team members in our villages. And to add to that one, we have a very well trained missionary lay group in our villages and also girls who are well trained in conducting adoration, manning our adoration places in not only in Arunachal Pradesh but in other places as well. So I take this opportunity once again to thank Xavier and all the members of the Spiritual Revival Ministry SRM. Thank you. Now I would like to point out to you that the speciality of the Arunachal missions is that it is a church that is founded, built up 
and nurtured by the laity. The first baptism took place in the 60s of young students who came from a place called Zero, uh, from a small tribe called Apatanis. They were baptized in a school in North Lakimbur in Assam. But as they were young boys and girls, they remained individual Christians and they could not have an impact on the society. But in 1978, a young tribal chief from Tirap district, from the village of Burduria called Wanglet, came in contact with the father Thomas Menam Parampil, who built up this relationship and visited Wanglet's place in 78. Unfortunately, their plans were cut, was cut short and uh, as Father Thomas and Wonglet met with an accident, Father Thomas had both his uh, kneecaps smashed and so he had to come to be taken down to Dibrugar in Assam for operation. As they waited all through the night with the smashed kneecaps rising in pain, Wonglet saw the condition of Father Thomas and asked him, Father, if uh, as a memory of your visit, as a fruit of your visit, if you baptize me tonight, how would it be? And Father Thomas could not have a better message than that, and so he was baptized. Next day, they came down to Dibrugar, he was treated, and the, but then the contact continued. More and more young boys were admitted in the schools in various places outside Arunachal. Arunachal, as you know, was a forbidden country for all kinds of missionary activities. And even today, we need a, a thing called inner line permit, which is equivalent to a visa. The difference between a visa and an inner line permit is, now of course inner line permit is available online, but till a few years, two years ago we can say, it was available only in the place. So if somebody had to come from another place, someone inside had to make the permit unlike the visa which you can make in your own country. And for us, with the Christian names, these visas would not easily be given. Anyway, uh, things have changed. Thanks be to God. Today things have changed a lot and we are able to have a very peaceful and uh, uh, flourishing church in Arunachal Pradesh. It is definitely the effort of uh, lay people, particularly the young men and women. How it was done was, uh, as we saw the success of, in a limited way, which began in Shillong, the church in the whole of Northeast took it up as a mission to, to collect or to admit young boys and girls into the schools. And they always went back during the holidays and told their parents and their relatives about the nice thing in Christianity and they accepted Christianity. So in 79, August 2nd, through the influence and contacts of Wonglet and other students who had gone to Shillong, 900 people got ready in the village of Borduria and they were baptized. As we know, inner permits were not given, but the, at the insistence of the people, Bishop Robert Kargata of Dibrigar, Father Thomas, the Salesian Provincial, a number of sisters were all taken to Borduria and the baptism took place and the first church that is consisting of bamboos and leaves, touched church was made and thus the church was established in Arunachal. From there, it was not just a breeze or a wind or a flood, but it was a real hurricane. People saw something wonderful in Christianity and started accepting it in big numbers. Village after village became Christian and as these young men and women went to the villages. Priests and nuns could not visit them, but at Easter and Christmas at least, and if possible in between, they would uh, make permits with uh, some other names in which it would be God. They would visit the villages and uh, confession and uh, mass and other baptisms would be done quietly. After the baptism in 1979, on the 2nd of August, Father Job Kalarikil was appointed to a place called Naharkatya in Assam, which is not far from the border of Arunachal, in order to keep in touch with his people. And from 79 to 85, he did his best to keep 
in contact with the people and also to evangelize those whom he could reach out to. In 1983, an institution called the Bosco Bible School was started in order to intensify this experiment with the young men and the women. Tinsukia being a big town in Assam, at the same time well connected by road to the other district, to the eastern districts of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, where many Arunachalis come down daily for shopping and doctor medicine and all this. It was a convenient place and this school called Bible School was started. This school, which was a residential facility, would only take young boys and girls and not children. They would be fitted into uh, class 6, which meant many of them came from villages where they had no education at all. And so class, would, class 6 would be almost like a kindergarten from where they would study forward. And the staff, I was the first one to be put there and along with my collaborators, we worked very hard and uh, in three and a half years, these boys and girls were able to pass matric and uh, along with the uh, academic subjects we taught them bible church history and the church catechism and the church documents every year in summer and in winter the school would be closed for two months before which we would prepare them with a three days intense bible camp all conducted by lay volunteers lay teachers from different parts of India so that they would be inspired and to go and to preach in the villages. Every student went to the village and preached and they were allowed to baptize. They baptized many and always brought the list back. During the year, we would call those who were baptized back to Tinsukia for a week of a retreat. We called it Bible camp at that time or in some case with youngsters alone, it was called leadership camp. In all these, we taught them Bible, we taught them the life of Moses and other leaders from the Bible, and then showed them the Bible film. And that was the most impressive part for them. She, seeing the Bible films and also uh, learning hymns. We never asked anybody to be baptized, and uh, but they, on their own, asked for baptism and they received baptism went back to the villages and they always communicated the message shared their faith with the others i remember a very silly incident when we had a, a group of 35 youngsters for a bible camp which always was for a week we finished the, we were on the second last day and we said tomorrow being the last day we shall have the uh, final mass during which you will be baptized. Those who want, please collect your names. So many volunteered or many asked for baptism and so I gave them a small booklet which had uh, many Christian names, both men and women, saints. So all the, of them chose their own names. But there was one young man who was not happy with any of those names. So he came and told me, Father, I don't want any of these names. I told him, come on, these are all the Christian names that I can think of. Now, I don't know what you want. Then he told me, I want a name from the Bible. So I gave him a good news Bible and told him, you go through this and select one name for yourself and then come and show me. So he gladly took the Bible, went through it, and in about 10 minutes came back jubilant saying, Father, I have found a good name. So I asked him, you may not be able to pronounce properly, so show me. So he showed me what he had selected and that was Sodom and Gomorrah. I laughed, but I had to explain to him that Sodom and Gomorrah was not a name to be chosen and I explained what it was. And finally, of course, he chose the name William and he was baptized as William. Now, this does not mean that they were silly about their faith. 
for them it was a conviction that Jesus called them. That is why even today, after so many years, if we ask many of the Catholics in Arunachal to recite the seven sacraments in order, baptism, confirmation, confession, communion and all that, they may not be able to do it. They may not be able to recite the Ten Commandments in order. But if you ask them in a most difficult time, why did you become a Christian? Their answer will be very clear. Because Jesus called me. Because Jesus chose me. And this is the most inspiring and most sustaining part of the church in Arunachal Pradesh. And the church grew, as I said, with the lay people. Students spoke to their villagers, their parents, their companions. Other leaders, like village leaders or political leaders, spoke to their companions. Business people spoke to their companions and invited them to Jesus. And not through preaching, but through sharing, they became apostles and others became baptized people, disciples of Jesus. It was only in 1993 that some sort of opening came. In 1992, I was given a special permission through the insistence of some of the people, through a loophole that they had found out in the law. And so, 92, I started staying in the village of Burduria and started the first school and the first Catholic hostel. Immediately after that, we started constructing the first church with a target to have it blessed on the 2nd of August 1993. And the people decided that we will have none other than Mother Teresa for the blessing. And when I went to meet Mother Teresa, she willingly cancelled the program in Denver for which she had signed up and volunteered to come to Arunachal because she said, I have been trying for the last 25 years to visit Arunachal but they never allowed me. If you are sure that I can come, I will come. And she did come. And 5,000 people gathered for the blessing of that church which became a landmark event and also we can say the opening of the gates to Arunachal Pradesh. Till then, everything was done by the lay people. From 93, now we have started opening parishes, churches, schools, hostels, hospitals, convents, college and all these. And priests and nuns have come in. Many religious congregations have come in. But we always hope, pray and we are making every effort possible to make sure that the importance of the laity is not wiped out. That the lay people remaining to be the founders of the churches, the lay people being those who plant and water as well as harvest the church in the, in the villages of Arunachal. We hope that it continues and that their leadership it never collapses. And the missionary idea that we have is from more than any other place. I would like to read with you what we read in the Acts of the Apostles, where in chapter 1, we have Peter standing up and telling the other believers. So one of the men who have become, who have accompanied us throughout the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So Peter is asking the crowd, about 150 believers, to choose one to be an apostle in the place of Judas. The only qualification that he places is it must be a person who knew Jesus. 
not the one who had studied about Jesus, not the one who had heard about Jesus, not the one who had seen Jesus, but who knew Jesus. My dear friends, today we have various forms of evangelization, various forms of communication, various forms of conducting missions, but more than any other passage, what I would ask that we insist in the church, in our communities, is that we follow this. That is, in the first place, if we are to be missionaries, we need to be people who experience Jesus. Not people who know him in the theology classes. Not people who know him in the scripture classes alone. But in personal experience. And in the same chapter of the Acts of Apostles, a little later, we read. We read very clearly that along with Mary, the mother of Jesus and other women and his brethren, they gathered together for the breaking of the bread and for prayers. This was their sustenance. They do not mention bishop, archbishop, rector, parish priest, assistant parish priest, Mother Superior, Parish Council, none of this is mentioned there. But simple folks like Mary, the mother of Jesus, other women, and those whom we call the apostles, the first disciples of Jesus, they prayed together and from there the mission sprang. Today, we have a lot of types of reaching out. I would say uh, many kinds of exercises or even juggleries and we call it evangelization. But how deep rooted is prayer in our ministry of evangelization? We read about Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus she was proclaimed the patroness of the missions, but she never went to the missions. She never went out of the convent to preach to anybody. But she became the universal patroness of the missions because she prayed for the missionaries and she prayed for the conversion of sinners. Our task is not to convert. Our task is not just to add numbers. But our task is what we say when we pray the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be your name, your kingdom come. So here we see God as our Father in the first place. We accept him as our Father. We accept ourselves as his children. And when we accept ourselves as his children, we accept others as our brothers and sisters. And we share this brotherhood among us. And that was the church of the Acts of the Apostles, where they shared not just their faith, but their life, their fellowship, their love for each other. And so the non-Christians around could say, look how they love each other. We too, we shall become like them. Can our church today be seen as a community of people who love? If our missionary endeavors have not succeeded, it is because we have not projected ourselves. And more than projecting, others have not experienced us as a community of love. Love which just flows out from us. I can tell you, 
over the 40 years that I have been in Arunachal, I have never gone around preaching, never calling people to come to the faith, but everyone came this side because they saw that we did everything for their sake. Though Borduria was Catholic from 1979, in 1992 when I went to live there, there were certain issues that they could not get over. Two particularly. One was, they had a, not only in Borduria, in the villages around, they had a terrible habit in which if a child was born with any minor deformity, even as much as an extra sixth finger or cleft lips, the midwife would kill those children there itself and the body would be thrown into a big stream which flows through the villages. And people understood that this was not nice. Other tribesmen were telling them that. But then because the superstition was so steeped in them that they could not get away with it. The Borduria people after becoming Christians, they wanted to stop it. But then the other villages which belonged to the same tribe and other tribes would not allow this. So one of the things, once I started staying with them, they told me was, we have this and we need to stop this. We have to become the pioneers. How shall we do it? We prayed, we discussed, and finally we said, any amount, and then they themselves said, the government had made rules they had even sent a policeman, but nothing doing. People had the superstition that this was a bad omen and the devil was active. And so nothing would be done. So we discussed, we deliberated, we prayed, and finally we came to the conclusion that only thing that can work effectively is that we pick up those children before they are killed. And we can begin that in Borduria because the midwife is a Catholic and she can inform us. And then we let these children grow and show to the world that they are smart children, no devil is associated with them. So we decided, then who will look after these children? So we said we will collect the children in a place and employ a woman. But then the question comes again whether um, a hired person would look after the children or not. Finally, we were inspired to meet Mother Teresa, appraise her of the situation and ask her to send the sisters, which we did. And the sisters came in 1992, December. All the children were handed over and in about three years, people realized that the children were smart. In fact, those babies with the children were smarter than those in the villages because sisters gave them regular food, regular bath and all that. And the first three batches of children were sent on adoption after which the parents said, no, we see there is no bad woman here. So they started taking the children back to their homes. And after about seven years, there were no children that were brought to the sisters because of this uh, bad woman. Because we have stopped this apostolate and the sisters have started another kind of ministry for the young TB patients and mothers who are malnutritious, uh, mal mal malnourished uh, so that they could have, the mother and child could have a better life. Another bad habit which we discussed, we prayed about and overcame was the burial. They were never burying or cremating a body but were keeping it on a platform which was the cause of all kinds of sicknesses. But talking about hygiene, how a Christian should be clean, we managed to get every village to bury their dead now. And this all happened, not because of preaching or teaching, but because we have been able to associate with them, to convince them that we are there for their good. Jesus is someone who wishes their good. And this attracted them to, to Jesus. 
It was not a big conversion like the conversion of Saul of Tarsus falling down from the horse and all these. No, it was a gradual transformation from darkness to light, from ignorance to wisdom. And they enjoyed this transition. They welcomed this transformation. And this transformation is what we call evangelization because they accepted Jesus. They have learned the ways of Jesus and today they proudly will say that they are Christians. They were headhunted till India became an independent country. But after, though the government banned headhunting, forgiveness was not in their blood at all. But after becoming Christians, they learned to forgive. They learned to accept each other. They learned to treat each other equally. And in the case of some of the tribes, the government itself has acknowledged, saying, thank God these tribes became Christians. Otherwise, today there would have been so many crimes. They would have been killing each other because they were literally wild head hunters. Today, they are followers of Jesus able to forgive, able to love, able to live together. And here I must also tell you with much joy that for them who belong to small tribes, when they hear that they belong to the Catholic Church, which is the biggest family on earth, that the same prayer that is said in this remote village of Arunachal is said in Tokyo and in San Francisco and in Sydney, they cannot just believe it. That the same mass is offered there, same readings are done, they just are flabbergasted and their thirst for Jesus, thirst for the church knows no bounds. This, dear friends, is the uniqueness of our church. And men and women of various positions coming to Arunachal from Esaran and interacting with the villagers, staying in those villages, eating what they are eating, staying in their huts, has had a tremendous impact on the people. There were occasions when we had to walk up to 12 hours from one village to the other. And when you reach there, all tired and fagged out. And when you hear from the people, you are the first one to come to this village. No other people, either from any religion or from the government has ever visited us. Thank you for coming. That shows that you have something nice to give us. And that nice thing was Jesus, the person of Jesus. And this is what we called a missionary activity. And this is what people accepted. This is what people loved. Today, we have men and women in all walks of life who proudly say that they are the church. And this church, as long as it is depending on them, I'm sure will go ahead and has a very bright future. I invite you all to join us in thanking God, in praying for our missions and also helping us, helping us to continue this mission, particularly to empower the young people to be good leaders of the church of, of becoming missionaries to their people and to the rest of the country. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of my servant Moses, righteousness be this door. And all these are the days of Israel.